This will be from the 14th chapter of my manuscript. It's from the character Daphne. And that was a good start. Daphne liked to think that she was a good judge of character. She wasn't perfect. Her ex-boyfriend was proof of that. But outside of certain blind, cheating assholes that wouldn't know a good thing if it shot them in the face, she felt good about relying on her first impressions of people. That's how she met Matt in the first place. She had a good feeling about him. Seeing him sitting in the back of the AA meetings, nervous and fretting, he looked like a man half his age. It wasn't love at first sight, that was for sure. Matt was a kicked puppy. The way she saw it, if saying hi managed to brighten his day, she wasn't out anything by doing it. From there, saying hi turned into coffee, and coffee turned into an open invitation to stop by whenever she was in town. It was sweet, between the age difference and the fact that they both knew she was out of his league. She hadn't felt any pressure around him. When her show ended and she went back to Massachusetts, she found that she actually missed Matt. So when she had another chance to show a, hold a show in Pittsburgh, she went. Back then, her art was just starting to sell. Not that she was rich, she didn't think that would ever happen. But for once, she was actually turning a profit. People were asking her to display her work rather than ignoring her. It felt great. The best she felt is that she'd come home to a note on the kitchen table telling her that her, all her boyfriend's things were gone. But then, that was the point. Throwing herself into her art, jumping at every opportunity to get out of town. She was doing everything she could so she could not think about the crap sack that was her life. The drinking was nothing new to her. She started with everyone else in high school, taking into clubs with a fake ID that wouldn't fool a blind man and partying until the sun came up where she was kicked out. That's how she met her first boyfriend, Leo. He was older, knew everyone who mattered on the scene, and was absolutely wild. She had the time of her life with him, went places she had only ever dreamed of, and did things that made the rush of her first rave look tame by comparison. She'd moved in with him before graduation, explicitly against her parents' wishes, which made it even better. Then he changed. Money was tight, and he wasn't always in a good mood anymore. The day he'd found a gray hair, she told him that was fine. A few more, and he looked distinguished. He hadn't taken that well. That night, he came home with a bouquet of roses, a bottle of Captain Morgan, and a promise he'd never hit her again. The promise lasted until the end of the month. Daphne frowned. Thinking about the past never did her any good. It just left her angry, sad, and thirsty for something stronger than the ginger ale she had limited herself to. But maybe if she had had thought more about the past, she'd have recognized what sort of person James was. There had to be signs, obvious ones. No one could beat a woman without being an obvious monster. Normal people, good people, wouldn't do that. But he was Matt's son for crying out loud. Does that mean she was wrong about Matt too? No, there was no way that she was wrong about him. There was no way that her ex-boyfriend would ever come back. She knew that Theo was back in town. It wasn't like she was stalking him, just kept in touch with their old mutual contacts. That was all. And if she happened to pour over his Facebook account before bed every night, that didn't prove anything. She'd watched the post fly between Theo and his new bimbo of the week. From that and the people she knew, it wasn't hard to figure out her ex hadn't changed much since he'd left her. He'd picked up a younger model with a little work done and sponge off her. She hates seeing them together. And when she started to see the signs that there was trouble in paradise, old sense of satisfaction at the other one of pain, which lasted right up until the wave of shame washed over her. That night she called Mathis and invited him up for the weekend. She didn't want to be alone, and he had two things going for him that made him a better choice than her usual friends. First off, he was safe. They met up quite a few times when she was back in Pittsburgh. She wasn't sure if he read anything more into her invitation than she meant, but he never pushed her. If she didn't say anything, he wouldn't bring it up. It was charming in its own way. All of her friends came pre-packaged with the local drama, and that was the last thing she wanted to endure. With Matt, never an issue. The second thing going for him was that he was willing to drop everything and make the trip on short notice. 
They were waiting for pizza delivery guy when the doorbell rang. She went to answer it. Theo was outside. He was visibly drunk and high as a kite, which wasn't unusual. It's how he always was up until he walked out. Hey, babe. His voice was slurred and almost unintelligible. She only started to recover from the shock of seeing him again when he reached out, pulled her to him, and kissed her. She tried to push him away, but he was too strong, and when she opened her mouth to scream, he shoved his tongue in. She was at his mercy, helpless like she'd been for so long. She hated it, but there wasn't anything she could do. The most she could do was clench her eyes shut and wait for it to end. Then she was wrenched out of Theo's grip and fell to the floor. Mathis was standing between her and Theo. Theo was desperately trying to stop the blood gushing from his nose. Daphne, Mathis said, drawing her attention away from the rest, call the cops. He didn't sound worked up. If anything, he was calmer than she could believe. But there was also a tightness in his voice, like he was only a step away from wailing on Theo. Hard for which he would. From that day on, he hadn't been able to see Matt as the same harmless friend as before. He loomed larger in her thoughts, stronger. It didn't hurt that the graying hair at his temples made him look distinguished. She was brought out of her thoughts when a familiar, sorry, a familiar voice startled her. Daphne, there you are. Do you have any idea how long I've been looking for you? Anita was bundled in a light coat that wasn't pulling up to the frigid air coming out of the garage. We're on a roll, but it would be better if you were actually there to meet the buyers, and do I want to know what you're doing? Daphne looked at the can of hairspray clenched in one hand and bar of soap in the other. The facing James Carr had seemed like a great idea an hour ago, and then her fingers had gone numb, the, sloped, the soap had slipped from her grip, and she dropped the bottle on the ground where it shattered before she could get the rest of it on his car. She succeeded in the end, but the process took longer than she wanted, which had given her mind time to wander. <laughs> Anita tapped her foot, and Daphne realized she started to space out again. Last minute cleaning, she said. The words came out as more of a question than a statement. Uh-huh. Anita was not buying it for a second, but her, <coughs> not my business. You need to get cleaned up and back to the show as soon as possible. I got one of the high rollers to make an offer. He doesn't want to finalize until he needs you. Give me 15 minutes to clean up, and I'll be there. Her current dress was a lost cause. Running around town in a cocktail gown wasn't her brightest idea. The fabric was wrinkled, and she knew that just something was sticking to the bottom of her shoe, even if she hadn't been able to bring herself to look. She was lucky that she planned ahead and set out a change of clothes. 20 minutes later, she would be walked into the showroom in a clean dress. She hadn't had time for a full shower and hoped that her perfume was enough to cover. Anita didn't scout. She was too much of a professional to do that while working on a sale. But she did make a point of tapping her watch. Daphne made enough to try and make it up to her later. The high roller's offer was generous, to say the least, except he seemed to treat that as an excuse for keeping the pinch her butt. She desperately wanted to slap him, but contained herself. He left once the details were set, but not before a last smack on her rear. He settled into one of the armchairs and closed her eyes. Dealing with too many assholes had left her feeling dirty. She was really looking forward to that shower. Here, Anita said as she offered Daphne a coat and took a seat nearby. She waited long enough for Daphne to take a sip, then asked, What's eating you? Other than being felt up by that sleaze? Nothing I can't handle. Uh-huh. And what happened to that guy from earlier? He wasn't who I thought he was. Daphne said. She sipped the coat. Some of the fish went up her nose, caught her in the sleeves. So, who was he? A secret admirer? Or was he just out of it in general? Neither. We had a friend in common. So, when I met him, I felt like I already knew him. Big shocker here, I didn't. And it hit me in the ass. Are you all right? I'll live, she said. I can't believe I was so stupid. What was I thinking? Don't know. Will this interfere with the show? Daphne shook her head. She was here for her art. Even if it wasn't the only reason she was here, she could forget that. Leaving with James had been a mistake. Anita probably wouldn't say anything, but they both knew that more than half the reason people came to her shows was to brush elbows with an up-and-coming artist. She was as much of an attraction as her paintings. She felt a tap on her shoulder, and Anita nodded to the entrance. An elderly couple had walked in, the wife leading the husband along. Showtime. 
you said before approaching us, giving her a few seconds to compose herself. She didn't get back to the hotel room until three in the morning. As the official opening of the show would be a good sized crowd, she spent hours talking about her paintings, what inspired her, and what she thought of the art scene in general. This was something she enjoyed. It made her feel like a real artist, invalidating all the rejections she dealt with when she first started. Except tonight she couldn't focus. Her thoughts kept drifting to Matt and James, and the giant mess she wanted them into. The less she said about his bitchy daughter, the better. Who throws a shit with him? Matt had issues. She'd known that from the start. Don't go to AA if your life is squeaking clean. But it had been so much easier when he was her when he was her damaged white knight, and his kids were only an abstract problem she didn't have to deal with. She didn't know she'd be able to fall asleep, but after a shower, the day caught up with her. She considered calling Matt. Time didn't matter. It wasn't like he'd pick up. He was terrible at that, but she wanted to reach out to him, even if it was just a voicemail. Once that was taken care of, she got into the bed, pulled the covers up around her. She needed to see Matt again. Seeing him always had a way of making her feel safer. Like any problem was more manageable. It would have to be a quick stop. She couldn't afford to spend that much time, or even as much as she wanted, especially not now. Anita had more or less forgiven her disappearance earlier in the day. But if she did again, she'd get the riot act for sure. That's the chapter. Thanks for watching, everyone. And if you want to jump in on the fun, every morning at 8 o'clock a.m. Eastern, I hold a live stream that's open to the public. Subscribe to the channel. It's the button right down there. If you hit it, it'll give you a notification when I'm online, and I'm free to have someone jump on in, so feel free to join. I actually look forward to it. And again, thanks for watching. Later.